from my reporting on the ground, talking to journalists and people on the streets, looking at the poll numbers now, it looks like the no OXO vote is the clear winner in tonight's vote. El cambio para Podemos. Multitudinaria manifestación de Podemos. Marea morada en el centro de Madrid. Matando y amigo, que no no representa no. Esta ciudad se merece a Ada Colau como alcaldesa porque la valentía es el motor del cambio. Hay una forma diferente de hacer política. Es esa diferencia que vos propongo. Candidato en nombre de la esperanza de un país nuevo y justo. Jeremy Corbyn, 251. We need a new rising, a rising at the ballot box, a rising against inequality, a rising against injustice. Yes, Europe will be democratized or it will disintegrate. This is not a scare tactic, it's a fact. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to the night orchestra directed by Enrico Melozzi, and thanks to all of you who came here tonight at the Roman Aquarium, to all those who are following us on the Republica TV channel and via streaming from all over the world. And I am 31 years old. I do not want to grow old in a failed continent, in an unfair continent, in a continent I should be ashamed of. I do not recognize by myself in the images that I see these days uh, coming from the Balkanic route, and I do not recognize myself in the decisions of a European Union that crisis after crisis is doing nothing but uh, proposing deals that do not uh, deal with the great challenges of the 21st century. The Europe uh, the, is not a theme that belongs to one uh, political force or another. It is, uh, we are no longer facing a time where we can divide ourselves amongst those who are more on the left or less on the left, more on the top or more on the bottom. We need to rebuild the space of democracy for each and every one of of us. The horrible, tragic images coming from Brussels remind ourselves of those images that be before the Europe was even conceived, the images that Altiero, Altero Spinelli had in mind when he was exiled in Ventotene and was dreaming for the first time of a united and peaceful Europe that can build a peaceful coexistence between the people. It is with that constituent spirit that we should face the current times in order to build a new political space that can welcome us and future generations. We no longer have constituent fathers and mothers to look at. The constituents of the present are those who are here tonight, those who are out of this uh, room, and, though, and, the, and all of those that are struggling for a fairer a more democratic Europe. It is starting from this consideration that we will open tonight's event um, with a spirit of unity but also of determination because to be united does not mean not to be determined 
to have your principles recognized or to contrast racism or to accept the fact that very few people control 50% of the world wealth. It does not mean that we can accept an economic model that will lead to the failure of the environment and of our societies as a whole. It does not mean to accept the fact that decisions in Europe are taken behind closed doors without asking the citizens what they want. It does not mean to accept the fact that we have a 42% rate of youth unemployment and that even in uh, Europe's richest country, in, Euro in Germany, you still have millions of people living in poverty. Unite, being united mean to understand that the challenges of the 21st century are, are challenges that are common to each and every one of us and that we must face this challenge starting from the sound principles that this continent expresses, justice, democracy, and also, and here we will get to Yanis, also a great ambition, that of not accepting the current status quo, but to say it can be done. We can. We can change our societies. We can change our Europe. We must not be happy with what uh, they are ready to give us. We must not accept the rhetoric of those that repeat us each and every day that there is no alternative to the tragedy that we are, uh, have experienced in recent years. Diem uh, breaks into the scene in a historic moment, one in which uh, the critical points of Europe are revealing themselves in all their criticality. I will ask uh, now Yanis to tell us what uh, Diem has in mind and what will happen starting from tomorrow, the 24th of March. Tonight is a beginning, I promise, a celebration. But this celebration is taking place against the backdrop of a tragedy in Brussels. We need to acknowledge that at this very moment in time in Europe, we are being tested. We are tested for our capacity to respond to common challenges together. Our unity is being tested. We are being tested for our capacity to be resolute in fighting the perpetrators and bringing them to justice. And we are tested in terms of our capacity to ensure that our reaction does not feed the beast of fear and terrorism the way previous reactions have, that we are striking hard not only at the perpetrators, but also at the causes of terrorism, of division, of discontent, of the failures to integrate. Not just minorities, but to integrate Europeans in the common home, which is Europe. Tonight, we are beginning with a great deal of optimism within this gloom and doom. We have youth together with music, and thus we cannot fail, especially when we start this in Rome. Why are we here? Why Diem? Because some of us, I think many of us, are united by a common concern that this great achievement of the past decades, the European Union is disintegrating all around us. And that it is disintegrating because its institutions are democracy-free zones. Thus, the slogan that you saw in the video, the European Union will be democratized or it will disintegrate. Diem is about that. Is Diem a political party? No, it is not. Let's be very clear about this. We are not in the business of creating another confederacy of existing political parties in different nation states in Brussels. We have that. It's not working very well. We are not in the business of creating national parties in Portugal, in Spain, in Britain, in Italy to compete against other national parties which are filling the space. What are we in the business of doing? We're in the business of creating the infrastructure that we don't have in Europe, a political infrastructure that we can use 
as European Democrats to join together to have the conversation we have not had in Europe about what are the common threats and the common problems and the common crisis and how can we deliver a common response to these threats. In the European Union Council, in the ECOFIN, in the Eurogroup, unbelievably and scandalously, this conversation has never taken place. The Greek crisis is a problem for the Greeks. Their debt must be paid by them. The Italian stagnation is a problem for the Italians. The German deflation is a problem for the Germans. The refugees in Greece are the problem for, for the Greeks, and we better turn them into a concentration camp. This fragmentation is the result of having created a European Union like a cartel and having grafted upon that cartel a money, the euro, that was meant to be apolitical, and you know there is nothing more political than apolitical money, except that it's toxically political, and wholly inefficient from a macroeconomic monetary perspective. So we created an edifice which was not capable of sustaining the earthquake of the 2008 version of 1929 that began in Wall Street, just like 1929 did. And just like 1929 gave rise to a fragmentation process, firstly of the currency of that period, the gold standard, then of Europe, with Europeans turning against one another and against themselves, exactly in the same way, our version of the gold standard, yes, the euro was created, was modeled, ridiculously, <laughs> on the gold exchange standard. It started disintegrating after our generation's 1929 took place in 2008, and the result was a similar slide. Diem is trying to do that which we failed as Democrats to do in 1930. To get together, whether we are left-wing Democrats, Green Democrats, Catholic Democrats, social conservative Democrats, um, radical Democrats, get together and form an alliance against the slide into this abyss. It is the infrastructure that invites Europeans, independently of their political party affiliation, independently of their nationality, independently of the language they speak or the culture that has nurtured them, to forge an alliance to stop this disintegration. Is Diem a top-down organization? No, it is not. We have the minimal amount of vertical coordination in physical meetings like this, but at the very same time we are putting a huge amount of effort into creating what we call spontaneous collectives of Europeans that spontaneously and without any kind of control or coordination form groups throughout Europe to pursue the aims of the manifesto, which you can read, you more or less heard them already from what we've said. Let me single out the six themes which we consider to be pivotal in saving Europe and in creating a common prosperity dream yet again. The six threats, battlegrounds on which Europe will be fought and won are transparency, the fact that no European knows how the decisions that shape our future are made, what decisions are made? What are the documents on which they are based? Denies us the chance of democracy. And the denial of the chance of democracy through the denial of transparency guarantees terrible outcomes and the disintegration. Secondly, the question of migration and refugees. Europe must develop a common approach to this, reflecting our determination to democratize and therefore reintegrate. Thirdly, a European Green New Deal, which will be the only way that we can redeploy existing institutions in order to address the crisis of debt, of the banking sector, of low investment, and of poverty. Fourth, green transition. Given that the Green New Deal that we are going to be fighting for will find the funds for 
investments into green energy and sustainable technologies, exactly what are these technologies going to be? What is the process of selecting who is going to be funded? And how can, this is crucial, I believe, and very little known, and little attention has been paid to it, how can we ensure that Europe remains technologically sovereign and not in the pocket of Google, of Microsoft, of the uh, megamoths on the other side of the Atlantic. And finally, the process towards a proper European Union constitution that can uniquely provide us with our identity. On the 9th of February, we began in Berlin. We went to Berlin coming from all over the, the continent with different cultures, different languages, different political pasts to join in with our German Democrat comrades in order to shake Europe, to do it gently, passionately, and hopefully. Tonight, we are here in Rome. Diem begins in Italy tonight, and we are launching our Transparency in Europe Now campaign today. Tonight, here in Rome, together we demand that light should be led into the European Union institutions. Tonight, we make our pledge. We refuse to go gently into the long night. Tonight, we rage against the dying of the light. Tonight, we are going to join with Diem. We are going to sign the petition. And we are going to begin the process of building a democratic Europe against the European Union institutions that are forging without even understanding it. It's downfall and against the sirens of those who want us to go back to the nation state where we will not be able to find succor, solace, peace and shared prosperity. Join us with Diem, with European alternatives, with all the progressives in Europe that want to bring unity where there is discord. Carpe diem. <laughs> Io ho, ho una persona I have a very important person that I wish to introduce to you an extraordinary member of European Parliament that works on a daily basis on the various topics that we just mentioned. Someone who has uh, sort of crossed the half the continent of Europe to be with us tonight because uh, she had to take a plane from Brussels last night. She has uh, stood as a candidate at the presidential election in Portugal and she got uh, 12 percent. Uh, uh, you've seen her in her introductory video and she will address us uh, later on, and she will tell us uh, in a few words what has happened last night in Brussels. Marisa Matias. You, you exaggerate a lot. <laughs> Good evening, uh, everybody. Yes, I came from Brussels today. It was a long journey. Unfortunately, this journey which started in Brussels yesterday is a journey which happens every single day across the world because of the terrorist attacks and terrorist actions. Uh, yesterday, we lived a very difficult day in Brussels, but not as different of the day that people lived in Baghdad two weeks ago and we didn't even listen about it. Yesterday, I was quite shocked. Of course, it's always difficult and different when we are dealing in, our, in the place we live, because the first thing we want to know is if our people is okay, if everyone is all right, and then we cannot talk with people. It's awful. That's why the terrorists do it, because they attack us in our daily lives, in our daily routines. I'm used to live in different contexts, in different terrorist attacks as well, not only in Brussels. So the thing that most shocked me yesterday, shocked me the most yesterday, 
had to do with the fact that Europe was against tested, and I must say it failed again the test. Again, uh, is, it was said by European institutions and some European leaders that Western values were put it into question once again. And I'm always thinking what they are talking about, honestly. It's not a question of Western values, because thousands of people have died already, and every single day people die in result of terrorist attacks or terrorist actions. And no, it's not the Western values which are at stake, it's our own freedom, our own common rights, our dignity and our humanity. And European leaders with responses through securitarian actions, through Fortress Europe, through trying to divide between us and them, do nothing but just continue to play the game of the fear and to try to uh, feed the terrorism as they are continued to deal uh, in our days. So I wish that with these democratic movements and all the movements, we should also start to think about finish with European hypocrisy because it's time to come to an end of putting business before people's lives. And yes, yesterday was a very tough day in Brussels as it is for a lot of people every single day across the world. So when... When we talk about terrorism, and that this is my last sentence, I just want to us always remember that we cannot erase two-thirds of the world every time we talk about terrorism. And we cannot erase the majority of the victims of terrorism when we talk about it, because we are only feeding it if we reproduce whatever they want to sell us. So we should bring diversity and we should accept that this is our very unconditioned diversity and this is the very unconditioned of democracy as well. Thank you very much. Okay, and so let us start.
stasera attraverso Tonight uh, we will discuss four of the main themes for a renewed vision of Europe. Migration, the environment, transparency and democracy. These uh, are connected to the four priorities that DM25 will work in the coming months and that were discussed this morning in a major um, meeting between Italian and European associations. Um, on top of those four themes we have the other two themes of jobs and finance. On the whole of these six points, in recent weeks, many meetings and assemblies were held. And tonight we will listen to a report on this morning's discussion that was articulated, as was said, on six thematic roundtables. On the issue of jobs, uh, Marta Silero will um, tell us everything about it. Good evening. Um my name is Marta Sillero. I speak on behalf of the Labour and its Values uh, table. This morning, during the, uh, during the assembly, we discussed about three main points we consider fundamental to start changing the terrible conditions in which millions of uh, European citizens uh, live today. Um, we think it's important to include it in the, in the manifesto since um, reference to job is um, it's, the manifesto talks about inequality, but not specifically about measures of, of jobs. So the first one we, pro we propose is to supersede uh, the idea of a national welfare in favor of a, uh, an initiative uh, at, the, at the European level. The second point we discuss um, is the possibilities of establishing a basic income in Europe. We discuss about how would it be founded and how would it relate with a minimum wage. And the third point we discuss is um, how to guarantee the dignity of European citizens because it doesn't make sense to talk about labor and its contract and conditions if we cannot guarantee uh, citizens' uh, dignity. Um, how can we start achieving these uh, three points? Um, the labor table brings three proposals. The first one is to establish a pan-European fund to assure common welfare. The second point is uh, we invite DM and all of you to participate in the popular uh, consultation that the Commission is, uh, currently, is currently leading until the end of this year. And the third point is to promote the European Citizens Initiative on, bas on basic income. Thank you. Let us continue with the reports on the theme of migration, Giuseppina Tucci. Human beings, citizens of the world, equal from the day of birth. This is who we are, this is who every migrant is, regardless of the fact that he or she is a refugee or an economic migrant. What do we want from Europe? We want to go beyond mere integration. We want human corridors. We want European asylum with mutual recognition of refugee status. We want to monitor hotspots at the European level. We want a humanitarian residence permit for unaccompanied children and we want the role of civil society to be um, enhanced against the criminalization of civil society that we instead experience every day at the local level. We invite each and everyone to join the mobilization uh, on borders and for DiEM to um, uh, address, the, to, to sign the, the, the charter that we propose this A parlare del dibattito on the issue of jobs, Paola Tamma. I apologize on the issue of the environment. Il riorientamento della produzione in reorienting production in uh, green terms uh, must be done through tax incentives if necessary uh, in order to pay back for uh, the environmental impact that today uh, citizens are paying for and it should be the um, companies and corporations paying for that. Moreover, the 
roundtable said, uh, decided that definitely we do need a Green New Deal, meaning to use European institutions and particularly the European Bank of Investment in order to finance green technologies. And so we need research and development for sustainable energy and uh, to build a real green economy and not to uh, support greenwashing operations. Then we believe that we should build a campaign for the disinvestment from fossil fuel. On the issue of transparency, uh, Daphne Bullespa. Thank you. Transparency was the word I was moderating this morning. So we are obviously having the campaign on transparency that we talked about, but what other issues are, are part of this, uh, of this topic? And we felt um, if we are making, we, we obviously can't just talk about transparency for transparency's sake. If we are making these data and uh, knowledge available, we need to talk about the access to that knowledge and how we empower people to use this uh, data and knowledge uh, effectively. So empowerment is really one of the key words that came out from our discussion. Also, a key part is, of course, to collaborate with those who are already building these instruments to give this empowerment to citizens to use data effectively and not simply um, giving, um, not just simply putting it there. And last but not least, um, for our own movements, we need to recognize transparency as the prerequisite uh, for our work and, um, and make it transparent um, how we are building the processes we are building tonight. Thank you, Daphne. Grazie. Nicolò Milanese ci parla del tema. Milanese will speak on democracy. What does it mean to be a European Democrat? It means to believe that people across Europe, beyond borders, can work together to create a better society, that citizens and non-citizens are already, through their words and actions, many of them creating a more democratic European constitution that we need to carry forward in a sense of solidarity, it means that our institutions, our political institutions, need to be spaces of liberty and of participation, and not spaces working against the interest of the people. And where those institutions are working against the interests of the people, they need to be contested. And it means that our cities are fields of experimentation, of democratic innovation, and not spaces where we should be afraid of each other. These are some of the themes that we brought up in the democracy table and then we commit to work towards. E per discutere dell'ultimo tema. That's about the last theme that of finance, Giulio Breglia. Gruppo Finanza. Finance group, we try to imagine uh, what uh, the institutional infrastructure could be in 2025, but we didn't make it. There are too many changes that we need uh, to achieve right here and now. Um, we need a real quantitative easing to support people and the local and local communities. We must uh, struggle against the fiscal compact and TTIP. We need a fiscal harmonization. We need a transparency in the boards of banking and public institutions and financing institutions. We need to contrast corruption and money laundering. It is difficult, but we can make it. I'd like to thank all those who have given the reports for the groups and all those who contributed to the discussion this morning and the assemblies which were held in the past weeks. Now we're going to elaborate more one of the most important topics of this evening is the topic of migration. We'd like to figure out the sort of Europe that we are dreaming of, a sort of the, the place where human rights are supported and upheld after sort of barbed wires and armies deployed along the borders of the Balkan route. The shameful agreement between the EU and Turkey shows once again that the 
states have decided to turn their backs to the migrants who are asking for uh, be taken in and uh, helped. Uh, to, to help Lorenza, we'll have uh, a Somali writer, Ichaba Shego, that wrote several novels. Uh, she's also contributing to several sort of newspapers, Repubblica and Internazionale, together with other writers who do not simply sort of come from the Horn of Africa, but use Italian as their sort of language, uh, preferred language. She's one of the leading authors of contemporary literature that has uh, sort of been able to capture the encounter of different cultures. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Chiaba Shego. And we'll have uh, the Portuguese member of parliament, uh, Marisa Matias, that will talk about migration. Uh, thank you, Ishaba. I'll, uh, I'll speak Italian with Ishaba and English with Marisa. So, thank you, and I'd like to thank the interpreters that help us understand each other. That's in everyone's minds. Only a few days ago, the European Union has signed an agreement with Turkey that many have defined uh, an inhuman as well as, in, as well as an ineffective agreement. And from your privileged seat of the European Parliament, I would like to ask you your opinion of it. Uh, hello again. If I would have a privileged seat in the European Parliament, that agreement would never exist. <laughs> okay, I think um, it's, um, it's not only inhuman, it's shameful. Um, it's exactly the opposite that we have to do concerning what is happening with the refugee, with the humanitarian crisis and with the migrants. Uh, who try to reach Europe. And I think it's even worse. It's, there's a perverse sense in this agreement um, because we are creating in Turkey a kind of a Guantanamo type two. Uh, we are just trying to move back to Turkey those who are trying to get away from Turkey and uh, to a country which not only has proved over the last years to play a double, double standard uh, game, um, but also which doesn't even, as a guarantee of uh, protect the human rights in the most uh, basic sense of it. We are not talking about a country which has, for instance, signed the declaration or the Convention of Geneva. We are not uh, talking about a country which has assumed any kind of responsibility uh, in terms of uh, refugees. In fact, ironically, the only kind of refugees that Turkey is obliged to accomplish with um, having some kind of protection to human rights are the European refugees. So. Uh, Everything is wrong. I don't know where to start. I don't know where, where to finish. But what do you think we should do? What do you think is an alternative response to the one that the European Council has given? I, I think that we are just making a huge crisis of something which could is, be solved in a much simpler way. First of all, first answer, safe passage. is not the end of the world. It's the only answer that we can give in a situation like that. Safe passage. If people say that we cannot have the conditions for having one million refugees in 28 member states, they must be kidding. And I'm talking about the emergency response because if we look, for instance, to Lebanon, a population of four million people, they have two million refugees there, 50% of the population. Uh, if we look to Jordan, 30% of the population. So European Union and European institutions also have opted for a kind of outsourcing um, service and trying to put the problems in the borders of the conflicts. We are not dealing with this for the first time. 
this problem has already decades. So we saw it with the countries from uh, North Africa. We now see it in the countries of Middle East. And now we see it with this agreement with Turkey. So for an emergency response, I would say safe passage and guarantee the conditions to receive the refugees who are searching Europe for asylum. That would be the emergency re response. But of course, there are a lot of others. And I've been fighting a lot in the European Parliament in order to pass an embargo to selling weapons to the, to the areas in conflict because we know very well that a lot of European countries have huge amount of business with, of businesses with countries which then pass the weapons to the terrorist groups and also an embargo to buying oil from the, oil, uh, the, the, the occupied territories by the terrorist groups. But even saying this, we are already talking just of a small part of the world and there, there are a lot of other countries uh, in, in Africa uh, also uh, needing our, our um, solidarity. And uh, we have responsibilities. I'm not going to tell the entire story, but we have responsibilities in these conflicts. And I, I think that emergency answer would be safe passage and, and to create finally an asylum seeker condition at European level because we don't have it and, and uh, as a, a more grounded uh, answer to start to deal with the problems at, at the origin and of course is not only in Syria or in Iraq uh, that we are having problems but I think we should think a lot when we see that even Iraq receives more refugees than the European Union as a whole. Uh, that means a lot about our behavior and the way we are not uh, dealing with this. But there are so many things that we can do that I yeah. could spend hours uh, And we'll get back to this at the, with, with, the last, with the last question. Safe passage, passo all'italiano, uh, corridoi umanitari. Humanitarian corridors. Italy has uh, proven in these uh, last few months that this is a possibility which is feasible. This was a pilot project started by the community of Sant'Egidio for Syrian refugees in the Lebanese camps. It's one of the few good examples of non-governmental activism uh, which should be followed uh, uh, by those who have the privilege of uh, ruling a country, Ichiabam. Could you help us um, taking a sort of uh, a broader approach than what is uh, covered in the media? When we talk about migration, we talk about the uh, Balkan route, uh, the war in Syria, but migration is a far more broader phenomenon that goes beyond the wars which are at the borders of Europe. So based on your own experience, could you share with us what it means to migrate over and above the humanitarian emergency? Good evening, everyone. I, I think we should uh, sort of have a more sort of broad-based uh, public uh, narrative about migration. So we should uh, start thinking about free movement of people, free movement of people that can travel freely. Because I think we're living in a apartheid like climate. You have people that are allowed to travel. You go uh, on the web, you purchase a low-cost uh, flight, and, and you can, uh, off you go. And then there are people who can't uh, travel. I uh, am Somali origin. I, I keep telling that my parents came to Italy by plane. My brother was studied in Prague, and he was traveling from Prague to Mogadishu. In the 70s, in the 80s, there was such a possibility of uh, traveling around. Today, from Somalia, from Eritrea, from uh, Western Africa and Syria, you can't come to Europe uh, legally, so you're forced to migrate. This is something 
you've got to understand, or else you don't understand why people take these rickety ships. I've been to Argeza in Somaliland, in northern area of Somalia, uh, for a book fair, because you have book fairs which are organized in Africa as well, even though you are not aware of it. I spoke with many young people. Uh, who want to? Who told me I want to go into Tarib, which is a journey towards the Mediterranean. But migrations are not simply dictated by the fact that you want to sort of flee the war. Of course, uh, Syrian uh, refugees are very much uh, in such a situation, and we in Somalia were faced with this situation. But on many occasions, people wish to travel around to 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 act as a tourist. Why do we? Are we standing in the way of such a possibility? Why do we think that body could be dangerous if that body migrates? Why do we feel that only European people, European youth, can travel around and gain some experience when they travel abroad? So we have to change our standpoint. This is crucial, and Europe could do much more than what it is doing, and it would be cheaper to do that. Uh, paradoxically, the security uh, process, the Frontex, uh, the, and the various institutions are uh, absolutely nonsense because they are extremely costly. It would be much cheaper to welcome people. It would be good for humanity. It would be less costly if the whole of the inhabitants of Eritrea and Syria would come to us in Europe. So it's a psychological problem. We are living a sort of a schizophrenic experience. Could you carry on on this sort of psychological line? Could you share with us a very strong uh, image that you used a few days ago when we met uh, that makes us uh, uh, consider the risk that we get used to the pain of others, the deaths that we see every day in the Mediterranean, in the Balkan route. We've got to bear in mind and remember that we've not, we've not always been so inhuman. No, we were in that way, especially that was true for Italy. I do remember when Jerry Maslow died. Jerry Maslow was a South African student who, who was killed in Villa Literno. I do recall that the funeral were broadcast live on television in 2005 when 13 Somali people died. There was a funeral which was organized at the Capitol Square, which is the square of town hall, and the whole of the Somali diaspora was there. There were many Italian uh, personalities. It was Pietro Ingrao and many other people. And that wasn't a very long time ago. So 13 people were, were too many. Now we're getting used to kids dying, drowning in the Aegean Sea. We're getting used to tragic choice. Uh, and the one thing which uh, sort of scares me is that at some point we'd have to choose between the European Union and human rights. We have to choose human rights in the European Union. That is crucial. And let me add one more point. Uh, on the question of uh, the journey, which I mentioned, I had uh, I wanted to mention here something which was uh, uh, mentioned by Kalin Metrev, a Moroccan journalist living in uh, Italy. For an African person, it's difficult to travel in Africa. Well, you need a visa to visit 50% of African countries. In many African countries, Egypt, where Junior Regeni was killed, uh, Equatorial Guinea, and Sao Tome Prince do not uh, issue a visa. So we have to consider that as well in our discussion. Thank you. I uh, move back to English. In Italian to you as well. I mean, people, okay. Va bene, allora continuiamo in italiano, spero, Marisa. 
carry on in Italian. And I hope I will speak Portuguese the next time round we meet. So I would like to pursue this discussion on the psychological um, issues. People get used to pain and sorrow. That is a fact. But I've also seen an extraordinary response to the pain and the sorrow of other people. I'm talking about the movement Refugee Welcome. Austrian citizens that went with a motorcade to pick up migrants from Hungary. And that is the sort of Europe that gives us hope and it makes us stay in Europe with some dignity. So I wanted to ask you, Marisa, how do you view the strength of European citizens to have a greater measure of dignity than the people who are ruling Europe? What hope we still have, honestly. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot answer in Italian. <laughs> I, I could try, but it would take a <laughs> long time. Um, I think is one. The hope we still have is is to, to, um, for instance, just to to come back for yesterday, which is uh, just a simple image. But uh, when all uh, all the leaders were concerned, and especially when I'm talking about Belgium, I was I'm referring to Belgium. Leaders were concerned of increasing security measures and blah, 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 all the things we know. People immediately started to do things like offering their houses to receive people. Uh, the taxi drivers just simply put the taxis uh, at service of everyone who wanted for free. So there are still some movements of solidarity. But I think that a major problem lies in the fact that um, we also see the increase of uh, racism and uh, xenophobia uh, movements like we were not used to see some years ago. And these are two parallel ways. They, 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 it's difficult that they cross, so uh, it's, it's kind of waiting to see what will happen, but I hope that, of course, solidarity will we'll win over racism and xenophobia and all these different movements, which are also uh, starting to gain terrain in, in, in Europe. Yeah. And um, in different countries, of course, not only in specific countries, in different countries. When we looked what is uh, happening, and I, I agree uh, what, uh, to what uh, Igiaba was saying, uh, why do we make a distinction between between or amongst refugee and economic migrants. Why, why do we do it? <laughs> People need to leave their countries, period. But we, we, it happens that we do it at some point just in order to be more efficient. And, and at the end, we are not efficient in any case. But it's true that I think we should not make this distinction, although we need it uh, for different purposes. But I think we should not do this distinction. And, uh, and across Europe, um, yes, we see these movements, but then they simply, um, there's, a, there's a need of a lot of strength. I'm contacted by these group movements, like for instance, refugees welcome all the time, because then they just um, have to deal with the huge amount of, bureauc of bureaucracy uh, which does not enable them to make their work as they want to do in terms of receiving refugees in this case. One very quick question to both of you. I'm going to ask you to give a suggestion to Yanis. Uh, Yanis uh, has taken the ambitious, ambitious step of launching a pan-European movement to change public opinion in Europe, as he was clearly explaining at the beginning, to change political processes in Europe. What do you think should be the one or two top priorities of the movement when it comes to the discussion we are having and to the refugee and migration situation? When it comes to migration, I think we have to put in the table a simple thing. European Union has a lot of agreements with different countries in the world and with all, all of them based mainly in economic trade, in trade rather than in other things. And, but we uh, should put as a condition 
than when it comes to visa or when it comes to travel allowances there should be reciprocity. We cannot, we cannot still having these kind of deals with all countries in the world in order that for these countries to get an agreement, an association agreement with us, they need to give up on their own capacity of letting us enter or not, but we put all the restrictions and I think that's one of the most unfair uh, things that we are dealing with. It's at the level of the, the European agreements and institutions and reciprocity would be a very good thing to, to, um, to put uh, in the table and to say we will not accept international cooperation based on this level of inequality, inequality and unequal treatment of people. Okay. A second issue has to do with, the, and is a very brief one, what uh, Igiaba said um, just before. We need to discuss human rights at the European Union. <laughs> We simply forget to do it and is the crucial dimension for this movement or any other movement. We cannot allow that just people or children or women which are suffering, uh, they, people just, I don't know how to say that, but they close their mouth with a, I don't know how to say it in English. They their mouth. Yes. Or we cannot allow the, to, to put people uh, in, in a, camps which, which were used for other means in the worst period of our history. You cannot allow to build walls and walls and walls which are much more expensive than to treat well people. And nevertheless, we still have this colonial capacity of putting into discussion human rights in every, every single seat of the European Parliament, Commission, Council, uh, and there's never ever a debate about human rights in Europe. And every time we try to put it, and I finish with this, like for instance with what is happening in Hungary, or so we cannot do it because as we know, human rights uh, are an issue outside Europe and not inside Europe. So starting by in, from inside could be a good, uh, a good suggestion, I would say. Good job. I will be very brief. I believe that one point is that of the representation we offer, not only when we speak of refugees, but on, at all levels to bear in mind that we migrants and the daughters and sons of migrants do exist and particularly in the course of time support the local struggles that are carried out. I am here with a member of the G2 generation of the G2 network in Italy. We still don't have a law on Italian citizenship and surely we will not have one uh, the law will not be passed because they consider us as a branch, as a terrorist branch. We are still, uh, the second generation migrants are still not recognized. I do hope that uh, the law will be passed uh, before I die. Yes, we will get the bill approved. I thank both of you, we started saying that DM should go uh, beyond uh, the belonging to this political force or the other, and this is really the sort of perspective you have expressed during the course of this conversation uh, to support safe passage, humanitarian corridors means simply to stay on the right side, to stay on the side of those who put the word dignity uh, at the first place. Thank you very much. And let's hope that we can continue working together and I, I am sure we will.
next uh, 17th of April, will cast a vote on the referendum on oil drilling at sea. Uh, to discuss this with us is a member of the National No Drilling Committee, which is a movement that since 2012 in Italy has tried to construct a development model based on the exploitation of fossil fuel. Marika Di Pieri, an activist and journalist, will join us on the stage. She's an activist that has been working on environmental and social issues for years. And exactly because the issue of the environment is strictly connected with that of an ecological transition for our economic model of development, it is a pleasure to call on the stage the international representative of FIOM CGIL, Valentina Orazzini. I want to start from a figure that connects the previous debate with the current one, and this number is 300 million. 300 million is the amount of money that uh, three weeks ago uh, the European Commission uh, has allocated to face the emergency of refugees on the Balkanic route. This was also the cost that the Italian state has paid not to organize a one single election day between the next referendum and the next administrative elections, and the, go the Italian government has decided to do so in order uh, to obstacle uh, the referendum that will be held on April the 17th. So we want to start from this point with Marika, Marika that with many others has been working hard uh, to um, for the referendum to be organized and I would like uh, you to tell us why it is important that we go and cast a vote on April the 17th. Yes, well. Going back to figures, let me tell you what the three, let me give you another number, 340 million, um, which is the amount of the royalties that we, um, that every year are paid by our companies in Italy. So it is clear that we are not uh, talking of particularly high royalties. They are a very limited uh, source of revenue for Italy. But Going back to the referendum, why is it important that we go and cast a vote on April the 17th? Well, number one, because we must protect the idea uh, that we can express our ideas and that the government cannot sabotage this act. And so we must really work for a massive, huge participation at the referendum. We are uh, facing huge difficulties because uh, the media is refusing to provide adequate coverage to the issue, but there are millions of citizens that are taking action regardless of the silence of the media to achieve our result. By participating to the referendum and casting our vote, we can contribute to an important result that can help us in uh, stop being dependent on fossil fuel. The era of fossil fuels is over. Uh, scientists know this. Uh, activists from all over the world uh, are aware of this. And so it is important, uh, the referendum, because we can help in building a future, a vision for the future. Italy participated in past December uh, to um, the uh, talks on, on the climate in Paris and she signed an agreement in which she took uh, in which Italy took precise commitments but the investments that our country is doing go in the opposite direction. So it is important for people to understand that to stopping drilling at sea goes in the direction of the commitments that Italy undertook in Paris. And so April the 17th is an important occasion to achieve this result.
ci dicono spesso they often tell us that if you stop offshore drilling or if you stop um, digging the soil we will lose jobs Valentina you're a trade unionist what do you think of that well FIOM is also the trade union that organizes the workers that produce the pipes that are also used for oil drilling. But we do not accept the, um, those who try to put jobs and environment in contrast with one another. We need to get rid of this framework and to get rid of those of that rhetoric that is trying to uh, play on this contradiction also uh, among workers. Um, of course, the, uh, it's, uh, the referendum will not have an immediate impact on jobs because at the center of the referendum is the duration of concessions for drilling, uh, of authorizations for drilling. But anyway, there is a more general point, which is that uh, the model that oil drilling is applying, applying is a failing model. Otherwise, um, we should not continue to simply uh, defend a model just because this way we will protect jobs by defending a model that is a 19th century one and this will not work. We have, of course, to bear in mind the complexities of uh, the world of labor, but we should not simply defend the status quo but rather have a more general vision in mind. This is why FIUM is contributing to the campaign on the no drilling referendum, but is also contributing to the campaign on uh, the constitutional referendum, because you cannot split uh, the discourse on democracy and on a social crisis and on the environment. We must think in overall terms and try and develop pr proposals that can keep these different aspects together. Okay, tell me more about this. Uh, one of the issues that also Yanis explored in his opening remarks is that of ecological transition. As a trade union and the one that is a metal working trade union represents somehow a 20th century model, uh, what is your position on the great issue of the green economic transition? Well, one of our proposals um, in the platform that we just presented, one of our proposals says that we should create a permanent table on environmental sustainability. Uh, this is because we believe German, in Germany a permanent table on this topic has been created more than three years ago. The problem in general is how we can um, think of a re productive reconversion also in terms of the impact of production that can create jobs. Yanis Varoufakis in his introduction spoke of maintaining a strategic sovereignty of the people with respect to Google. We all use smartphones, but smartphones did not appear out of nowhere. The Silicon Valley is the result of a process of investment. So together with the digital revolution, we should really think of a in terms of a circular economy that is supported also through investments in order to create sustainability plans that can work in terms of prevention and not simply in terms of controlling the damaging effects. Of course, this is also connected to the issue of no knowledge, education, and so far and so forth. Yes, and one of the most important proposals of DiEM25 has to do with what you just said and make sure that the ECB stops printing 80 million euros a month just to give them to the banks 
but rather to invest this money directly in buying uh, bonds from the European Bank of Investment so that we can build a great investment plan at the European level for a green transformation of our productive sphere. America. There are those who say that you need oil drilling in order to create jobs, but that's not the case. You need drilling or you won't have uh, uh, any energy. Is that true? No, that's not true. What we need, what is urgent, is to uh, engage in a radical rethinking of the economic system. We often speak of change, but in fact, no change occurs, just slight, slight corrections are introduced. We must understand that the difference between the green economy and a deep radical reconversion of what we produce, as Valentina just said, we must think in terms of how we produce, what we produce, um, for which reason we produce, and we need public investments that and we need structural funds and European funds to be redirected towards uh, green technologies. Uh, we are still investing a huge amount of money every year in fossil, fossil fuels, and all that money could be uh, reinvested for different purposes. The issue of the energy is a central one, which is at the heart of our economy, and giving up fossil fuels is something that we just have to do and as fast as we can. Scientists have told us that our biosphere can only absorb emissions deriving from one-fifth of uh, the current drilling sites. This means that all the other ones must be shut down. We do have alternatives in terms of renewable energies and in terms of an energetic democracy. Uh, let me quote a study by the Stanford and Berkeley University that was recently published. They verified that with the existing technologies in the United States, you could create a scenario where by 2050 you can uh, fuel, produce all the energy the United States needs only through renewable energies. So it means that the objective can be achieved, but there is a lack of a political will, and that is why, uh, as a society, we must push in this direction. Thank you, Marika. Consigli per gli acquisti. Per gli acquisti di Yanis. Che cosa gli consigliamo? What can we suggest to Yanis? Uh, what should we do? Uh, tell me one minute as uh, DM25 um, on the environment and the ecological transition. Well, I believe that another point that is strictly connected to that of the environment is that of democratization. And democratization is an issue that does not interest only European in institutions, but also decision-making processes at the local level where local communities are the victims of, um, of very negative environmental effects and effects for the, he for the health, and they do not have a voice. So bringing democracy back into our societies is essential. And if we wish to democratize Europe, we must also think how we can rebuild democracy at the community level. This is essential. Uh, you know, and we need also to use the existing tools in this direction, including uh, the tool of the referendum on April the 17th. Io continuo su quanto stava dicendo su quanto stava dicendo Mario. Let me just continue in the same on the point of the referendum. 
the fact that we need, again, democratic control over our local communities is an essential point, and it is not a case that um, the government is trying to sabotage on this. We are speaking of a government that was not elected and is telling Italian citizens that they should not cast a vote. So basically what they're saying is that popular sovereignty is dangerous on these issues. So I believe that the issue of democracy is essential also from an environmental perspective and also that the other thing that we need at the European level is a single industrial policy, a single energy policy at the European level. You said, uh, Lorenzo, you just said, I am 31 years old. I do not wish to be uh, a witness to the failure of Europe. I personally uh, belong to that generation that was educated in the name of the environment and uh, and now what we see is instead a situation uh, where we are making horrible agreements uh, uh, to sacrifice migrants in the name of, of agreements with countries that, for our interests. And really, we should uh, go back to two essential values for our people being pro-European and in favor of the environment. Thank you for moving to the 21st century, Google, and in a few minutes we'll have Julian Assange. The third theme of this evening is transparency, which is the very foundation of democracy. There is no informed citizenship without vigilant citizenship. Transparency in Europe means to reduce the lack of transparency of meetings and summits of the European institutions, or most, and for, but foremost, to put in the public domain all the documents concerning negotiations on the TTIP, the free trade uh, treaty between uh, Europe and the United States. Well, the leader of Link, uh, Katja Kipping, is going to talk about TTIP. Uh, that was at the fault spoon at the first uh, launch of DiEM, and it was also contributing to, the, to this uh, debate. Well, then there will be Julian Assange participating, who has been fighting uh, since 2006 uh, to make, to disclose uh, millions of data and material which concern the government and the commission for the European Union, uh, the, in the European Union, his detention is arbitrary, and he, uh, he will not be able to be with us, but we will have a live streaming uh, from the Ecuador embassy in London, where he has received the political asylum. He's a journalist and activist, has been fighting uh, for years to release information and uh, give it back to citizens. So Julian Assange will 
participate in the debate. From the Roman Aquarium, we'll have a Sresco Orbit in a dialogue with Lorenzo. He's a Croatian philosopher. He's among the leading representatives of the new left in the post-Yugoslavia era. He's a very sort of a strong advocate of the DM movement and one of the most active promoter. The theme that they are going to discuss is the first European campaign on transparency that is going to be launched from here, from the Roman Aquarium. You're too restless, too restless writing books, too restless launching European movements with Yanis Varoufakis. I think we keep you on two feet, otherwise you're going to launch a couple more things just tonight. And instead, we need to launch just one thing, which is the transparency campaign that DiEM is going to begin its campaigning career with. But first, let's go help me out. Transparency is a word that is not always very clear. One minute, what is transparency? <laughs> this is not really, tra I mean, transparent to say it in one minute, uh, but let's try. Uh, let me start with a picture about the world in which we live today. It is a world which was described even before Old Huxley and George Orwell, the famous dystopian uh, science fiction novels. In 1921, you have a novel which is called We, by a Russian novelist who is called Evgeny Zamyatin. And he imagines a world where all the houses of the people who live in the world, the walls are out of glass, and everything is transparent. They have only one hour per day to have sex, except there is one, one condition, they have to register the time for the sex and the partner for the sex. This was the first novel in the Soviet Empire which was censored, even 10 years before the Stalinist purge started. And I think we live in such a world today already, except that we don't even have this one hour of privacy anymore. Big companies from Google, Microsoft and so on, succeeded to bring us into our surveillance society. So what we can see on the one hand, is that all our lives are completely transparent, but on the other hand, the decisions about our lives are not transparent. Let me give you just two short examples which will bring us into the campaign and into the reason why this is the first campaign of DiEM. That's my and next question, of, Zesko, so don't, okay, but let don't me steal my just, questions. Let me give you just two <laughs> examples. You didn't give me a chance to sit down, so <laughs> I'm sorry. First example, several weeks ago, the Euro European Council met in Brussels. And they were discussing, among other things, the UK referendum and the refugee crisis. <laughs> Did we follow it? Did we have a live stream on that? No. But you see what's happening with the refugee crisis today. Second example, Mr. Juncker said, we have nothing to hide. However, on the other hand, the biggest secret agreement in recent human history the triumvirate of three secret agreements, TTIP, TISA, and TPP, is being negotiated behind closed doors. 52 states will form a new economic bloc, which Hillary Clinton, probably the next president of the US, called the economic NATO. These secret agreements will completely change our daily lives, from internet to intellectual property, medicine, corporations we have, will have the opportunity to sue countries such as Italy, Croatia, and so on, and we didn't have any chance to see the secret agreements. Only thanks to WikiLeaks and to someone who will be soon here, this is Julian Assange, we had a glance into these secret agreements. And let me just end, because I think we have to speak about Brussels today here. First, yes, we have to condemn terrorism everywhere, but there are two things which will happen after Brussels, I think. The first thing is, our lives will become even more transparent. And the second, I think what we can expect in the European Union in the months to follow is something what happened after 9-11 in US, and this is the Patriot Act. I think what we will have in Europe is a new Patriot Act on European level. And it is not by chance that after Paris, Paris was the first moment, after Paris, the former boss of CIA said that people such as Edward Snowden, people such as Julian Assange, have blood on their hands. Why do they have blood on their hands? 
because they were the people who were revealing the secret agreements. They were the ones who were revealing the secrets of the centers of power, and those people now are in Moscow or in the Ecuadorian embassy for four years. Is this the future society where we want to live in? I think no, and this is the, one of the reasons why DM is starting the campaign. Thank you, thank you, Zdrachko. And on the theme of TTIP, I think we've got uh, Katya telling us, cells telling us something. Katya Keeping was on the stage in Berlin on the 9th of February. She was one of the people who, at the very beginning, uh, expressed her, in, her enthusiasm uh, to join and support Diem and to take it forward. And here is Katya for you. Liebe Freundinnen und Freunde von Diem 25. Ich sende euch hiermit solidarische Grüße aus Berlin. Ich habe gehört, wir planen eine Initiative für mehr Transparenz. Das begrüße ich ausdrücklich, gerade mit Blick auf die TTIP-Dokumente. In Berlin gibt es ja jetzt einen Leseraum für Abgeordnete für die Dokumente des TTIP. Und als ich da rein wollte, musste ich unterschreiben, dass ich nichts sage über das, was ich dort lese. Ich habe mich gefragt, Wer hat eigentlich diese Verhandlungsgruppen von Seiten der EU und der USA legitimiert? Ich erinnere mich an keiner Wahl, wo man ihnen das Recht gegeben hat, über unsere Köpfe hinweg zu entscheiden. Nun musste ich unterschreiben, nichts zu sagen, was ich gelesen habe, also kann ich nur darüber sprechen, was ich nicht gelesen habe. Ich habe in diesem TTIP-Leseraum keinen Vorschlag für mehr Verbraucherschutz gelesen. Ich habe keinen Vorschlag für einen besseren Schutz von Beschäftigten gelesen und keinen Vorschlag für mehr Umweltschutz oder mehr Demokratie gelesen. Die Geheimniskrämerei ist entlarvend. Denn wer vorhat, ein Abkommen für mehr Demokratie, mehr Verbraucherschutz, mehr Umweltschutz zu treffen, der muss das Licht der Öffentlichkeit eben nicht scheuen. Insofern haben mich meine Erfahrungen im TTIP-Leseraum darin bestärkt, Abkommen wie das TTIP und wie CETA sind zu stoppen und es braucht Transparenz. Democracy needs transparency. Let's fight for it. Julian. Come diceva, parlando di TTIP. As uh, somebody said, uh, talking about TTIP, uh, if there was no need to keep it secret, they wouldn't keep it secret. So it's true and correct what Katya said. Why do we need to keep secret all the documents pertaining to TTIP? So, uh, and this <laughs> Julian is... Julian. The same in Berlin and so on. But, Zrechko, uh, to build up on what Katya was saying, while we, while we wait for the connection with Julian to be established, as you can imagine, it is uh, not the most straightforward Skype call to make. Why do you think that uh, negotiations with TTIP are being kept secret? Why? Mm. <coughs> I think what is happening with TTIP is something which should worry all of us. What they are trying to do is that, I mean, if you take into, con into consideration the bigger geopolitical picture, what U.S. is trying to do, they were always fighting about against Euro-Asian integration. So the problem is that China and Russia are already cooperating on two, two fields. The first field is the new Silk Road, which will make the possibility po realistic and possible that cheap Chinese goods will come from Beijing to Hamburg in two or three days. And the second one is energetic deals. So this is the biggest fear of the US, and this is the reason why US is now trying to integrate the European Union in something which Hillary Clinton calls the new economic NATO. And I think this should worry us, not only because there is no transparency, but because the institutions of the European Union are not functioning. So when the European Council, when the European Parliament met several weeks ago, they got an agreement between the European Commission and the US and the lobbies from the biggest corporations in the world. And you know, the situation was that the European Parliament, only, the only thing they have to do and they can do 
is to agree on something which was already agreed. So what TTIP shows is a perfect example that the democratic institutions of Europe are not functioning. And uh, while we wait for the connection with Julian to be established, let's get a bit ahead of ourselves. DiEM is launching its first campaign on transparency. And after Assange, we will see exactly how it's going to work, and we will invite everyone to start signing this petition. But tell us a little bit more what's in this petition. What is it that DiEM is going to be asking for concretely through it? So we have several main requests. One of the main requests is that all meetings of the Eurogroup, of ECOFIN, and of the European Council will be live streamed. Today on television you can watch the Big Brother and it's live streamed. Today on tele, but you know, is Big Brother so important for our daily lives? Today you can even see this. It's live streamed. It is, such, is it such a big problem to have a live streaming today in the 21st century? Our second demand is that all these meetings, including the meetings of the European Central Bank, have transcripts released several weeks after the meetings, and then also minutes before the transcripts. Our next request is that we have a register of more than 10,000 lobbyists in Brussels who are deciding our lives. And our third request is that immediately all the parts of TTIP will be public. And I invite you all to join it, and we will explain it later how you can join. Can I get an update on the connection with Julian? <laughs> Shall I see what's happening? Ah, he's coming. Hi. Julian! Julian, good evening and welcome here. It is extraordinarily... Firstly, we don't hear you. We need to fix the sound. While we try to raise the sound, I should say, speaking about TTIP, that the only reason why we know something about the negotiations of TTIP is because of the documents that WikiLeaks provided us with. Julian. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, perfectly. Uh -huh. Well, I, I was last in Rome in 2009, uh, but alas, have not had the opportunity to be there since. But uh, I suppose this is the next best thing, uh, some sort of dystopian future that uh, if we don't do our jobs right, we might all end up in. Julian, um, tell us why you're behind this campaign on transparency and tell us why this is the issue to begin a movement for democracy with. And then I will leave you to exchange a couple of words with Zrechko, who has had the great chance of, uh, of bringing you close to us. Great chance, the great uh, honor. honor. And fun. Well, look, let's understand uh, what the basics of democracy is. Uh, it's all of us together collectively sharing our knowledge about our environment and our will uh, to change it in particular ways uh, and to oppose change in other ways. Uh, now that requires knowledge of what the circumstance we find ourselves in and it requires an ability to communicate with each other. So uh, the transparency of our environment uh, is coupled together with freedom of expression in a very uh, close relationship. Uh, they are mirror images of each other. Uh, and we value them uh, not because we're concerned with boring process words uh, like transparency, uh, but because it is what makes us human uh, to understand our environment, uh, to share that understanding, uh, and to uh, develop a will together to make a better environment. The problem we're seeing in Europe right now uh, is uh, there is a decreasing uh, political will uh, for the European Union to exist at all. So presently the European Union is doomed. Uh, it has got to either transform, uh, democratize, 
uh, or it will uh, dissolve entirely. And that would be a, a great shame for Europe. It will bring, in fact, uh, possibly quite serious uh, poverty and uh, calamity on some parts of Europe. But it is a, <coughs> a significant problem for other people in the world. Uh, presently, if we look at states in Africa, what are their choices? They can choose to deal with, broadly speaking, uh, the United States uh, as a uh, legal and geopolitical and trade entity, or they can choose to deal with China. Uh, now, there's other players as well, but they exist in the gaps uh, between these two. That's not enough of a choice for people around the world. Uh, in the post-war period, Europe uh, established at an ideological level some things that we find to be valuable, concern for each other, how to resolve disputes and conflicts. And yes, of course, they took place uh, under the umbrella of NATO and in a post-war period and to some extent uh, were artificial. I think these are very important things uh, to be held on to. And if we're not able to generate the correct political will to do so, uh, they will simply disappear and we'll be left with only big power politics. <coughs> now, why is the will for the European Union to exist uh, in a state of collapse? It is because there is a fundamental democratic deficit in the European Union. That deficit arises in two places. Number one, it arises from a failure to be transparent. How can people support or oppose what key power institutions in the European Union are doing uh, if their activities and how they come to their decisions uh, is opaque. People cannot choose to support it. Uh, and then secondly, uh, even if the European Union in areas uh, gains more transparency, uh, how, is the political, how does the political feedback operate? Is there um, mechanisms uh, for, pe for European, for peoples across Europe uh, to express their support uh, or opposition uh, to what is going on. Now, everyone can see by the decisions of the European Union, uh, by its failure uh, to deal with the Eurozone crisis, uh, by its failure uh, to deal with uh, terrorism within Europe, uh, by its failure to uh, fairly and in a unified manner uh, deal with the problems of migration. Uh, that the European Union is not acting to address the concerns of people in Europe. So, uh, of course, that results in decreasing political will for the existence of the European Union. Uh, now, we're seeing that in many different ways. On the left, uh, on the in the populist right, uh, even to some degree uh, amongst certain establishments uh, that exist, for example, in the United Kingdom. If the European Union can't be transparent uh, and responsive to the democratic concerns of its people, it loses political will and <coughs> it simply loses the ability to act. Uh, now, I want to go back to Brussels. Um, now I had family uh, in Paris. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, Islamic terrorism and some other forms of terrorism uh, our reality to a small amount of people from time to time in Europe, but it could grow larger. Uh, parasitizing on the back of that uh, is a security response, and Treco is absolutely right that we can expect, and we have already seen at, at a national level uh, in the United Kingdom uh, and in France, uh, European versions of the Patriot Act uh, that will fundamentally undermine those things which make Europe as an ideological construct, something that is worth supporting. Now, that didn't come from nowhere. Uh, it came, Islamic terrorism in Europe didn't came, come from nowhere. It came as a result of fundamental weaknesses in the unity and coherence of the European Union, which permitted individual member states to engage <coughs> in crazed adventurism uh, in the Middle East, for a variety of reasons. Unilateral adventurism. So yes, the United Kingdom uh, was a central component of that with the United States. Uh, but also France, 
uh, also Italy. Uh, now, we've just recently released uh, uh, 32,000 of Hillary Clinton's emails, and you can read all about um, the UK and France's and the Italian energy company ENI's uh, involvement in Libya, where it says nakedly that uh, Cameron uh, and Sarkozy, uh, in exchange for their part in the war against Libya, uh, wanted more than 35% uh, of Libya's oil. That is not something that the majority of European citizens would support, a war for oil. Uh, they wouldn't support it because most people are decent people. Uh, they wouldn't support it because some people understand that if you bring war and terrorism uh, to another country, war and terrorism can come back to you. The sorts of terrorist attacks that we saw in Paris, uh, that we saw in Brussels, similar death counts caused by terrorism, uh, caused by Western arms and bombs, uh, have been suffered by the peoples of Iraq, Syria, uh, and Libya uh, since 2003. That kind of violence happening almost every day. Uh, so you can imagine um, the changes in the structures to those societies, uh, having the, that kind of suffering to them. Uh, that has produced not only, that, ha that has provided uh, fuel for the construct construction of a political an ideological swamp filled with hatred and revenge, uh, and Europe is suffering the consequences as a result. So I think we um, must understand that when the European Union lacks coherence in relation to its foreign policy concerns, when individual member states effectively run off uh, with US geopolitical ambitions, the result is terrorism, within Europe. The result is mass migration flows within Europe. Uh, it was obvious that this was going to happen. Uh, I was speaking about this and many others at the time that it was happening uh, <coughs> in 2011 uh, and beyond. And many people uh, on the left and some uh, on the popular right were speaking about it at the time uh, of the Iraq war. This uh, strategic blunder uh, from a European perspective, would come to haunt Europe, and it has. Um, okay, so uh, going on to another major uh, strategic blunder. Uh, yes, it is unfair. Uh, yes, it is unjust and ideological. But more than that, uh, it is something that is not even within, even um, beneficial uh, to uh, much of the ruling classes, I think, ultimately in Europe, and that is entering into the TTIP in the way that it is presently constructed. <coughs> uh, the United States, seeing the rise of China, uh, understands that it uh, may lose some dominance uh, in the South Pacific uh, and in Eurasia. It has been concerned for a very long time about the uh, possible integration of Eurasia. Uh, the United States, has, as a strategic concept, uh, is an integrated landmass, uh, one currency, uh, one language, uh, one people from a sort of white Christian perspective. Um, and as a result, it is a natural superpower. The only uh, possible rivals for that uh, are the European Union and China and the integration of Eurasia. So let's, let's look at it. Why does Europe not have a foreign policy that can project uh, the best of its values, making agreements with people, uh, enforcing genuine human rights? Uh, Europe has, the European Union has 508 million people. It has a GDP significantly larger than the United States and significantly larger than China. Uh, why is it always in a position uh, where it is uh, following uh, the U.S. lead. It is, it is in a position where it can do much better for itself and for the rest of the world. The uh, TTIP is part of three agreements which have 
geopolitical ambitions to ring China. Uh, that's the TPP, which involves the US and Asian states, uh, the TISA, which involves 52 states, uh, and the transatlantic agreement between the United States and Europe, the TTIP. Uh, that's more than two thirds of uh, global GDP bound up in these agreements. Uh, now, that puts Europe on a, that uh, constructs a new economic, legal, and to a degree military block uh, to face off with China. Is that something uh, that the people have Europe have all bought into? The construction, as Hillary Clinton says, of a new economic NATO, or as Defence Secretary Ashton Carter said uh, late last year, uh, a, uh, a new aircraft carrier uh, for the uh, engagement uh, in the Asia Pacific. I don't think that that's something uh, that the European people agree to, and the uh, form in which it's proposed, it is not something they can agree to because there is no transparency in it. Uh, so, <coughs> GM has uh, produced uh, a demand of the uh, Commission, uh, which is on the, or should shortly be, uh, on the website. And I want to uh, briefly go through that uh, demand. Julian, I need to ask you one minute uh, to wrap one this minute. up. Okay. okay. Um, That's the nasty job I've got here, Julian. Please yeah, sympathize yeah, I know, with I know. me. Uh, the TTIP is not a mere trade treaty, but a new economic and legal order which creates permanent obligations on the member states to dramatically alter their own laws. Uh, the TTIP draws within its ambit laws governing labour, work conditions, health and safety, food safety, transportation, infrastructure, postal services, <coughs> wildlife, environmental protections, intellectual property, which is everything that we do over the internet. Uh, data governance and financial services regulation. So this is an ideological project which restructures the economic and legal basis for all people within the European Union. It locks it in in the form of a treaty. So you can forget about any kind of national level politics. Do you want more of a social democratic state uh, do you want more of an anarcho-capitalist state? Do you want uh, more of a socialist state? Uh, or any other variation? You can forget about that. Once the TTPIP is passed in the versions that are proposed, uh, those political questions are at an end. Um, so the demands are... I won't go through them all. Um, <coughs> uh, but... We're going to show the petition text uh, in uh, just text. one minute, okay. so you can be extremely okay. concise in giving us the bulk of them. Okay. So there's about six points. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the release of the texts as they're negotiated after each round. This is done with other serious agreements, uh, not small ones, but other serious agreements. It is done the rest of the world, and it can be done with the TTIP. An immediate end to DG trade, uh, that's the body of the... European Commission responsible for negotiating this agreement, to engaging in politicised efforts to promote the TTIP before the text is even finalised. It's not the Commission's role to be promoting the agreement to a, a trade uh, agreement where we don't even know what it is. Uh, that's a political function. DG Trade's responsibility is to negotiate agreements, not to push and propagandise uh, the public into agreeing to them afterwards. Immediate changes to the procedure of the European Parliament uh, to give it the chance to review the chapters after each successful round of negotiation. It, at the moment, it's take it at all or leave it at all. And many genuine trade issues are ending up into the TTIP, acting as a coercive ratchet uh, to prevent uh, people from blocking it because of the other measures that are in the TTIP which many people think should be opposed. And the immediate suspension of all TTIP negotiations with the United States until it agrees to the same or closely similar standards to those proposed uh, to these demands. Why is that necessary? 
Well, it's a brotherly act to the people of the United States. However, there's something key for people within the European Union. The European Union has released some material, not the key negotiated texts, but proposals. The United States has not. So what has been happening is the European Union has been laundering the most controversial, the most controversial proposals into the US. You make that proposal in your material because you're not making any of that public and some of ours we have to make public. That has got to come to an end. Julian, thank you so very much for being here tonight. And if I, if I may, let me just add that I really hope that next time Julian will come to Rome very soon. Now, let's see this petition. Can I get Olga, Vukoli, Olga Vukovic from wemove.org to join me? DiEM is launching the petition, but you're doing it obviously with partners. One of them is wemove.org, which is a pan-European petition platform, and one that I believe shares many of our ideas that we have been discussing this evening. Olga, tell us in a second why you're doing this. One second. Ooh. Um, so, quick note, it's wemove.eu. I haven't, I haven't released this, Rechko, have you I? You haven't been dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> and first, give me a hug. Olga and I know yeah. each other since many years. Very many years. And we've worked <laughs> together in different capacities, and I'm really delighted to have you here now. And I'm very happy to be here. You've stolen her second now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all gone. Um, so, yes, I am, as Lorenzo said, I'm here on behalf of wemove.eu, uh, not .org, um, because we're a European organization, and we are um, hosting DM's very first campaign on our platform this evening. Um, and I just wanted to take uh, a little bit of time to tell you uh, why it's also important that they're hosting the platform with us um, before launching into the official first signature of the petition. Um, so WeMove.eu was born, as I think many other organizations here this evening, out of a complete desperation of the state of affairs in Europe, but also out of the knowledge that people power can and will make a difference. Um, so the way that we work is we harness the power of online organizing, um, and we combine that with the increasing need on behalf of Europeans to... Um, make sure that the people who are taking decisions in our names um, do that with us in mind and not with the corporations and not with the banks and not with the lobbyists. Um, and so I think for a lot of us in this room tonight, maybe being active for Europe, um, for a more democratic and fair Europe is probably second nature. But for a lot of people, it's actually really difficult to get engaged. And so when we're dealing with a topic like transparency in decision making, I think the average person says, how, how could I have an impact on that. So what we do is we allow people to get engaged with a single click, which for many people opens up a whole new world of powers, um, and then they increase their engagement, and that's how we build solidarity. And here is the petition, right? Yes. So, okay. So to get to the petition, um, this is the text. Um, it's offered in different languages. Um, I was talking about people power before. The more of us that there are, the stronger this petition will be. So after the first official signatory, which will be Yanis, the petition will officially be launched and live, and you're all invited to sign it, to share it, and spread it far and wide. And the text of the petition, you will see, well summarizes what you heard Julian Assange telling us just a few minutes ago and Zrechko before him. That field is empty. We need a first signature to start the petition. I see Yanis is doing something. Now everybody is going to try and get Yanis' email to send you heartfelt emoticons. <laughs> Olga, this is the first signature, is it? This is exactly the first signature. And when can everybody start signing this petition? Right after Yanis has signed, you right. can all start. Um, the petition is live, it's available in different languages. Um, and, and there boom. we go. Number one. <laughs> well, now it's up to you to go and sign it. You can start now from your mobile phones or maybe at home as soon as you get home tonight, but not later than that, please. 
Who do I get this to? Grazie ancora una volta. Thank you again to uh, the orchestra that is accompanying us tonight with some um, notorious uh, pieces and others that have been originally composed by Enrico Melozzi. Thank you again. And now let us move to the last theme for tonight, that of democracy, in order to um, lay the basis for an alternative future, we must give back to citizens the possibility to choose the coordinates of the world they wish to live in, and not to have a very small minority, the 1%, taking decisions on our behalf. The issue of democracy will be discussed together with Lorenzo tonight with a top level. Um, political exponent, uh, someone who really d needs no introduction. She was uh, a communist MP, a member for years of the uh, Union of Italian Women. She was one of the founders of the newspaper in Manifesto, and she's still nowadays an extremely active woman who has been elected many times to the European Parliament. It is an honor to have Luciana Castellina here with us tonight. And also Jorge Mourinho will talk about democracy, democracy um, a close cooperator of Pablo Iglesias, the leader of the Podemos uh, party that was uh, created after the Ignatius movement and now wants to be an instrument for the creation of a participatory democracy and is working on issues such as protection of the environment and the contrast to uh, the power of corporations. Yanis Varoufakis will join the conversation. Luciana Castellina. Luciana Castellina, Jorge Moruno, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, we are better than a TV talk show. They asked me um, 
to try and sort of start wrapping up because we cannot keep people here in this aquarium for too long. So let's try to sort of start moving towards the conclusion of tonight's event, but not the conclusion of the current process. Luciana. You have seen the European Union being created. Do you fear sometimes that you might die seeing its end? Well, of course, I am not very optimistic. I am rather pessimistic. But to be concrete, the issue of democracy does not only have to do with European institutions. Let's say that the European Union has been a pioneer in introducing what has been called uh, as the post-democracy. And this started in 1973, after the rebel years of the 1960s and the early 70s, when they said, well, democracy, we can't afford democracy. The system cannot afford democracy. Uh, the economy is a complex matter. We cannot have parliaments dealing with it. Uh, technocrats must take care of that. And this process started back then, and we are now in its full deployment, not just in Europe, also um, here at home and elsewhere. But what I wish to say, and I wish to tell Diem to pay attention to one point, because Europe has done an extraordinary operation, that of expelling the people from its structure. Of course, we know that there is no European people. We were supposed to build the European people. It was difficult, and perhaps we did not succeed. But uh, the uh, German Constitutional Court uh, said something extremely important. It said the European Union is not democratic because there is a lack of a sovereign people. And there is a lack of a sovereign people because we do not have the intermediate bodies that can guarantee democracy in the intermediation between the individual citizen and the state, political parties, media, trade unions, organizations. And so how did Europe solve the matter? Well, it said, OK, you do not have the people, but you have the individuals. Of course, if there is nothing left but individuals, there is really not much hope for us because we will have individual rights, but we will not have a collective subject. So if we help the process of building these intermediate bodies, these intermediate structures which do not exist, uh, at the moment, uh, th this is something that will, in fact, uh, help the European Union with the game that they're trying to play. Grazie mille, Luciana. Se abbiamo un altro. Thank you, Luciana. If we perhaps change a microphone because there was a little bit of a difficulty. Thanks. One uh, yeah. to address what Luciana was saying. How do you uh, tackle the crisis of intermediary bodies in the European Union? And what is DiEM going to do in terms of reinforcing, the, uh, reinforcing those intermediary bodies? That is to say, what is going to be DiEM's approach to political parties, trade unions, and organized social movements? Uh, perhaps we start with that. First things first, the question of individuals versus the police. Once upon a time, both the left and the right confidently proclaimed that there can be no individual human outside the police. So the individualization of the citizens is part of the disintegration of the European commons. So you're absolutely right. Where we have failed as Democrats, whether we're left or liberal, is in ensuring that the process of transferring powers from our nation states to Brussels and to Frankfurt is done in a manner where this sovereignty it doesn't go into a black hole. Unfortunately, this is what has been happening for the last few 
decades, especially with the creation of the Eurozone. How do we reverse it? Because the problem with the line of argument that democracy is a luxury that we can afford is exactly that which Winston Churchill outlined, that democracy may, may be a terrible and very expensive and, uh, system that uh, requires such very long meetings that make all of you very tired, but nevertheless is the best of all alternatives. And the reason why democracy evolved was not because we decided that it's nice, it's because without it, the decision, the politics becomes toxic and the economic outcomes become catastrophic. What do we need to do to respond to your question directly? Well, what we need to do is to create the infrastructure that we're trying to create where all those intermediary bodies, whether they are social movements, trade unions, organizations, can join forces in order to confront the European Union institutions and their particular contempt for democratic process. Effectively to say to them that this cannot go on. We will deny you the oxygen of power if you insist on power relations of the 19th century brutal kind. The whole point about constitutions is to convert power relations into political relations. The European Union has been about depoliticizing political decisions in Europe. It is disintegrating. Either it will be democratized or it will perish. Jorge, if I... If I can, can bring you in, if you, if you can respond in English, that would be amazing because it would save us time. But if you prefer Castilian, I understand it sounds much better than English. I will English. do it in, in Spanish, so sorry. No, fine, totally fine, English totally fine. Is, it's quite difficult. Sorry, it's my, it's my horrible role of having to keep time, yeah, which I really don't here. recommend to anybody best. else. Okay, um, Jorge, directly on what uh, Yanis just said, and uh, perhaps to address one of the... Uh, uh, responses that uh, we often get when uh, presenting Diem, uh, Yanis says that in nine years Europe would have to be uh, and become a fully democratized continent. And the answer is, oh, but this is madness, oh, but this is folly. Nine years is such a short time for such complex historical processes. And yet, Podemos was founded two years ago, and in two years you managed to completely upturn uh, the political dynamic and the political rhetoric in Spain, and uh, you went very close to winning elections just two months ago. So tell us, how does this work? Uh, is it true that nine years is too long if you can do this in two years? And how do you do, do okay. it? Um, bueno, primero de todo, me gustaría decía Raymond Williams que all, el acto de comunicar Raymond es Williams. un acto de comunidad de en sí mismo. Así que yo le querría dar las gracias a todas las traductoras que están haciendo... Sorry, I think you have to do it consecutively, vale. otherwise our, our interpreters will go crazy. Vale. Tienes que, después de cada cinco minutos, para. Vale, ok. Yeah, Digo que decía un autor que se llamaba Raymond Williams que el acto de comunicar es un acto de comunidad en sí mismo. Así que yo querría Raymond agradecerles Williams. a todas las traductoras el formidable trabajo que están haciendo para que nos podamos comunicar entre todos nosotros y nosotras. I'm not a translator, but I do my best. Se llama latín. ¿Cómo se ha conseguido lo de Podemos? Eh, en España existen ahora mucho de lo que se llaman podemólogos, mucha gente que de repente es experta en explicar qué ha sucedido para que Podemos eh, alcance la, la cuota de poder, la, el, el éxito, digamos, que ha tenido en las elecciones. En España hay personas que creen que saben y saben todo sobre Podemos, creen que pueden explicar y pueden dar ideas sobre cómo fue creado, cuándo fue nacido, cómo viene de dónde viene. Y yo la primera respuesta siempre que, que doy y que damos es, them, and, and give, es que no hay receta, no hay libro de storytelling, no hay ningún manual que te diga cómo ganar. No to how to win. Entonces, la idea es, en España hubo una situación de lo que llamamos crisis de régimen, que es una crisis del poder constituido. We had a crisis of constituting power. Um, it's an ongoing crisis. En un primer momento, esta crisis de régimen se manifiesta por arriba. Es decir, las élites 
se emancipan del pacto social alcanzado en los años 70 en España después de la dictadura militar. The first crisis comes from the power when they decide to be stop representing the, the, the citizens, the, the populations, and they stop representing them. Son ellos los que ponen en duda esas reglas básicas que consiguieron, con todas las críticas, la posible introducción de las masas de la población española con una cierta expectativa de vida al medio largo plazo. They stop following representing those people and they start respecting the rules of that pact between citizens and democracy. Si quieres lo hago luego resumes muy rápido. Okay. Eh, la idea es, ¿qué pasó en España? En España hubo algo que se llamó el 15M, que son los indignados, que fue la crisis de régimen, pero por abajo. ¿Qué hizo el 15M? El 15M lo que hizo sobre todo es poner en duda el relato oficial que hasta ese momento se había dado sobre eh, la crisis. La crisis era para las élites un efecto meteorológico, algo que sucede sin explicación eh, y solo con víctimas, pero sin culpables. The 15M was the movement that said that it was enough. It was the movement who said that the, it was the moment to, to start changing, to start taking the power from bottom up and start changing the, the, the rules that were not respecting anymore from, from, the, from, from the politicians. Se da, por lo tanto, una politización de la sociedad. Lo que antes se vivía de manera individual, en soledad, y que cada uno se lamía solo las heridas, se convierte en algo político. Si te echan de tu casa, ya no es por tu culpa. Si estás en paro, si sufres la precariedad, ya no es por tu culpa. Hay razones colectivas y hay soluciones colectivas. Then what happens is that people start stop complaining in their private lives and start complaining in their houses and they start joining together and discussing about what was going on, how to change the things and if they are killing kill, kicking out of your house, you have the right to discuss with your neighbor and you, start the, you have the right to go into, into demonstrations, go to the streets, doing politics on the streets from the basis. Por lo tanto, Podemos no se puede explicar de manera aislada. Podemos lo que hace es surfear la ola creada por la, por la sociedad en movimiento, por la sociedad moviéndose y la sociedad impugnando la palabra oficial, el relato oficial de lo que sucedía y de lo que puede suceder. Podemos lo que hace es hacer preguntas y decir que el status quo no es el que to follow, el status quo es posible cambiar we can change the status quo. Okay. Podemos. Okay. Y ya, muy, muy rápidamente, para, para terminar. Sí, y, y después vuelvo, vuelvo contigo. ¿eh? Así que... ¿Cuáles son las claves de Podemos? Una, el marco izquierda y derecha ya no sirve. First key of Podemos. Left and right is not, in, is, is not anymore the only dimension of discussion in politics. It's not working anymore. La frontera para entender cómo unos pocos, una minoría privilegiada, acumula cada vez más poder en menos manos. How to understand that the minority is the one who is taking all the power, taking all the decisions from the majority, from the people. Entendimos que había que mover esa frontera. We understand that this is enough. Y a partir de ese momento dijimos, no es izquierda y derecha. No more left and right. Es arriba y abajo. It's bottom up. Hay una mayoría empobrecida que sufre la crisis. There are thousands of millions of citizens that are suffering, they are poor, they don't have jobs. Que algunos se llaman de izquierdas, pero otros no. Some of them are from the left, but some, of, some others not. Y sufren, mantienen una indignación no articulada que consigue, lo que consigue Podemos es tratar de darle voz a esa indignación popular que no se adscribe a una etiqueta. And they are frustrated, they are indignados, Podemos that Podemos give voice to all those um, who said basta, who, say, who said it's y, y enough. Para, para terminar. And to close. And to close. Eh, Podemos utiliza la idea de casta, aquí la conocéis mucho en Italia, la idea de casta, pero de una forma articulada, ideológicamente distinta, creo. Podemos uses the word casta in a different way that Italians do. La cuestión es... A different way. Okay. They, they use it in a different way. They don't use the word casta in the same as Italians. La cuestión yeah. es, los, los políticos elegidos por la ciudadanía ya no responden a la soberanía popular, se han emancipado. Politicians are not responding anymore to sovereignty, to popular sovereignty. They have said they are not doing it anymore. They have revealed from their... 
job. Y por lo tanto mantienen un estrecho lazo con las élites financieras. Por lo tanto, han secuestrado la democracia y han secuestrado la decisión de la sociedad. Y en este momento es cuando el propio Parlamento, históricamente liberal, se they convierte… Have, they have kidnapped democracy in Europe and they said that it's enough um, and, they, and they keep following financial institutions' decisions. Solo defendiendo los, los derechos humanos, la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos, ya se convierte automáticamente en un elemento de radicalidad democrática. Just defending human rights, it's an yeah. element of being radical in democracy. Gracias, gracias mille, Jorge. Gracias. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you for what you just said and for the hope that Podemos um, is conveying to the rest of Europe uh, the uh, sense that it can be done. Si se puede, um, that is, uh, was expressed in Spain, but thanks to what you're doing, it becomes a possibility also elsewhere. Yanis and I will now switch to uh, the English language. Shana, so that we can then wrap up the evening, and I uh, will need you for this as well, so don't think you can leave just yet. Um, and my question is this, um, two points from what Jorge's, Jorge has been saying. The first, to respond to the question of the difference between left and right. You have said repeatedly that uh, DiEM is a transversal movement that welcomes uh, Democrats of all sorts, and I think I would like to ask you to clarify what you mean by that. And uh, a second question, I will ask both of them at the same time, is the question of uh, who is the people of, of Diem? Podemos has been built on the incredible experience of the Indignados and of the 15M. Large-scale mass mobilizations in the squares, without which uh, the experience of Podemos would certainly have been very much more difficult and perhaps less meaningful. Where is the social power, the popular power, that you're counting on uh, in the process onwards with uh, DiEM? The distinction between left and right will always be pertinent as long as there is capitalism. Nevertheless, in Europe today, we have neoliberals that demand of a government, the Greek government and other governments, to increase corporate tax and increase VAT when the left-wing government is fighting to reduce them. At the same time, we have left-wing governments that are reducing pensions in order to comply with the Troika. The distinctions have been crushed by the ironclad will of the Troika not to impose neoliberalism, but in order to ensure that the current power structures remain intact, as even though they are through increasing doses of authoritarianism, imposing policies that are destroying the ecosystems, even these powers require to survive. So Diem is not left-wing or right-wing. I am a left-winger, but I would love to see in Diem all sorts of Democrats coalesce in a coalition in order to stop the slide into the postmodern 1930s that are in front of us. Who are the subjects of Diem? those people. Europeans who understand that united to stand, divided, we collapse into a postmodern 1930s. Luciana, io, io ti chiederei di rispondere a quanto hai sentito e chiudere. Luciana, can you answer the question which was asked here? Uh, well, many people, uh, well, my grandparents uh, talked about Europe uh, as a peace project. How are you telling about uh, Europe to your grandchildren? Well, the Europe was built uh, as a result of Cold War. Could you, could you just use a different microphone? Well, you should tell your grandchildren that the Europe that was built uh, was built that way because it was a part of the Cold War and had nothing whatsoever to do with the people that thought about Europe and dreamed about Europe in Ventotene. But let me conclude on a point uh, about what Yanis said. We should ask ourselves the following question. Why that we are the 99% whilst the others are just 1%? We never seem to be the winning, the winners. Uh, 
uh, well, it, uh, well, we could say it's easy to say, no, I don't like this and I can uh, denounce it, but it's very difficult to ensure that there is unity on a project uh, that if we want to change the situation, and that's why we keep being defeated. So let's be very careful. I don't think it's enough to just think about rights and transparency. We must uh, ensure that we get some power, decision-making power, and uh, I'm not saying that we've got to take the Winter Palace, uh, as was uh, what happened in Russia in 1917. And I, don't, and I say that it's not enough to have uh, 60 or 65 percent of votes to be in charge, but uh, we do get, have decision-making power. If we organize society through the unions, uh, direct democracy bodies, uh, which starts uh, the uh, mindset of people. Uh, uh, so that uh, sort of the uh, and the opposition may sort of retake some of the roles that have been expropriated by the government. So I'm saying this just to say, let's beware. Let's not simply ask uh, that we uphold the human rights. Human rights are crucial, of course, but we need some power to sort of ensure that they're being upheld. Uh, so let, let's not uh, make the mistake uh, about that, uh, what's happening in Europe uh, with the support of many theoretical sort of uh, advocates is that of thinking of Europe of citizens, a Europe of individuals. That means that they will only think in terms of rights without the actual decision making power to implement those rights, fulfill those rights. Uh, there were European movements. It's not true that there weren't movements in Europe which were strong. We had the peace movement, and we have the World Social Forum, we have a movement on water and common goods uh, which were pursued. What we failed uh, to achieve is to consolidate uh, sort of power structures having a real sort of ability to intervene. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luciana. I think that the question about power is uh, key, essential, and Yanis has had the first-hand experience at that, uh, taking power with Syriza in Greece, and then he discovered that if you take power, it doesn't mean you do have power. I promised I would let you out of this hole before 11, so I have to sort of quickly move to the final uh, notes of this event. Uh, very happy because we're going to close uh, with a video from one of the leading uh, word intellectuals, a sociologist, Saxia Sassen, a very strong advocate of the what we're doing here tonight. There'll be a video by Saskia, a three-minute video. She might have been with us tonight if she could move quickly, fly from Mexico City. And then we'll tell you with Yanis what is it that we plan to do in the forthcoming months. And then we'll have a glass of wine together. To level movement, to bring all the extraordinary initiatives that are happening in Europe together. Today, we live under an economy marked by a logic of extraction. Even finance is extractive. Traditional banking sold something it had, money, for an interest. It was also keen on having the sons and daughters make more money to make more loans. Today, finance, totally different. Finance sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have lies its danger. And it invades other sectors via extraordinarily complex instruments. It extracts, just like mining. And when it's done extracting, just like mining, it leaves destruction behind. The way we are measuring the economy, I think of it as a form of economic cleansing. Yes, just like ethnic cleansing. I mean it in a negative sense. There is too much left out, too many of the unemployed, 
too many of those who committed suicide when their little shop went bankrupt. Too many of those who have simply become invisible. They have been expelled from all measures of that we have for the economy. If we actually measured everything that is happening in a country or in a continent, we would get a very different picture. One might ask, why are they so keen on saying, ah, Greece is back to 1.2% growth. Why? Why? Because the investors benefit from this. The investors need growth. The investors need. So what that economic cleansing does, it eliminates far too many negatives. Most people, increasingly, are going to be in that zone that is not counted. One real issue, one challenge we confront is that even as all of these expulsions are happening, there are ma many parts of our economy that look gloriously well. They look good. There is growth happening. Our cities are more beautiful than ever. But of course, that all rests on a lot of invisible expulsions. Second aspect, very quickly, what can we do? There is a lot that needs to be done. Let me pick up on one element, the importance of relocalizing as much as we can relocalize. Do we really need a multinational to get a cup of coffee? And mind you, Starbucks is moving into more and more European cities. We don't need Starbucks. We don't need all the other franchises. Out with all franchises. Every franchise takes something out of the community and moves it on to headquarters. Same thing, we all need a bank. We do not need an affiliate of a multinational financial firm because it also extracts. How about going back to rotating credit associations, to all kinds of localized events? This is clearly partial. But if we could begin to think about what are the knowledges that all the members of a community have. I know immigrant workers who are actually medical doctors, trained as medical doctors, but now are handling parking lots because of questions, you know, that if you are a doctor from a foreign country, etc. But the knowledge is there. Imagine if every one of our localities sort of had a track, a record of all the knowledges present in the members of their community. Imagine a poor community has a medical doctor whom they can call on. That is sort of an image that is also part of the relocalizing. But this notion of relocalizing clearly is partial, but it is one item. In short, there is much work to be done. I need you for one last minute, Yanis. We're going to... <laughs> Thank you. Grazie mille, grazie mille. Thank you for being here tonight. We will not keep you for much longer, but we believe it is important and perhaps necessary to leave you with an information on what will happen in the next few months at the European and Italian level. Of course, it is clearly a work in progress, but one that intends to make progress and uh, with great ambitions. Yanis, tell us something of what will happen in Europe with Diem in the next few months. The next steps involve the following. Next week, we participate in the debates about economic policy in Britain as part of uh, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and its new agenda for bringing investment up to the standards which are necessary in order to make Britain not just an economy that is sustained by the city and the housing market, but an economy which is perfectly capable, once again, to bathe and to bask in the light of technological innovation and social justice. 7th of April, Again in London, we participate in an event, the purpose of which is to create um, a new dialogue, a new debate regarding the referendum on 
of Britain's uh, place in the European Union. We are going, the DiEM line will be, the British must reclaim their democracy. They must stay in the European Union to fight with us for the democratization of the European Union. Then on the 5th of May, we move to Vienna, a very important battleground for the refugee issue, where together with the Transform Network, we are holding a DiEM event to discuss the refugee crisis in the capital, which is facing a backlash from the ultra-right in the capital that has ordered an Austrian policemen to block the passage, the safe passage of refugees between Greece, Macedonia, Slovenia, and so on. Then we are going to start a process of the following up assemblies. We are going to have an assembly on the Green New Deal, because as you said correctly, unless Diem puts forward a policy which addresses the question of how to deal with the debt crisis, with the banking crisis, with the low investment crisis, with the poverty crisis, in a manner which engages average Europeans and makes them think, my goodness, these people have something to propose which can change our lives tomorrow without bringing up first all the important constitutional questions and the questions of human rights. So the, the next assembly will be on the Green New Deal. Other assemblies will follow on the question of labor, its value, and the distribution of income and basic income. Another assembly will be on the green transition and, as I, we mentioned before, Europe's technological sovereignty. And, of course, finally, within a period of 18 months, we will have completed our assemblies with the European Union Constitution. So Diem will have a program for Europe, an agenda for Europe, by the, the end of 2017. Just a couple of words of what's going to happen in, in Italy. It's not so easy for me to wear an Italian hat. I've lived 10, 12 years abroad. I've come back last year. We work with the European alternatives at EU level with the passion for Europe, which made us very close to Yanis. That being said, it's important to stress that for the first time, a major European process starts from Rome, from Italy, after the launch in the 9th of February in Berlin. This is the first sort of step undertaken by DM a long journey, which is going to be a long journey. And for, for this time, it's important that we are at the core of a leading European process. What's going to happen in Italy? Uh, I have a very simple answer to this question. No one can decide about the next steps. There's only sort of a community that should be built to decide about the next steps. There shouldn't be a group which is in competition with other players, but rather we want to bring uh, together different ideas, ambitions. So there should be a participatory process with local meetings in the key cities that will uh, sort of hold uh, elections uh, with the intervention of local uh, sort of groupings similar to what happened in Spain. Cities such as uh, L'Aquila, which is a symbol of a city that doesn't seem to work any longer. But it's not a matter of setting up a new uh, movement uh, like Diem uh, Italy, which is competing with others. Uh, it is a participatory process which will would ensure that DiEM is active, engaging, actively engaged in Italy so that uh, a great many people can feel supported by what is done by DiEM uh, in Italy. Well, the challenge is that of saying, well, working at a local level, at a city level, just working uh, on a number of themes which were mentioned by those who discussed about them during the assembly, one can be still in touch with the rest of you. Europe and the realities of other countries of Europe and fight together for the radical change of Europe. So a major participatory process at all levels, uh, which will be defined by the self-organized efforts of those that will join in the efforts, uh, will attend a number of meetings. This is what is needed.
that if we want to set in motion new hopes and, and a process of uh, sort of bringing together the best talents, uh, we should sort of set ourselves very high ambitions. Uh, we have to be sort of uh, aiming at changing everything in Europe, in Italy, starting from tomorrow. Devo, devo fare la parte più importante della... Sorry, just uh, let me go to the um, various uh, thanks. Uh, that is the most important uh, part of the evening. So you can't have this participatory pro uh, process without a great many people that have helped us. I'd like to thank all the guests that participated. Uh, to our event tonight, to whom we wish to thank for their passion and for their patience. The two uh, persons in charge of conducting the debate uh, tonight, uh, Alice Litz and Carmela Mantaggio, the extraordinary staff for European Alternatives, my own organization, that has uh, uh, really worked uh, very hard to make it possible to make it all possible. A team uh, consisting of three girls uh, were born in 1992, which makes me hopeful that uh, we can change everything with the new generation, Giuseppina Tucci, Marta Messe, Paola Tamma. And I hope they are with us right now. I'd like to thank all the volunteers that responded to our emails and helped us uh, uh, getting into the room and uh, pushing you to uh, give some uh, money because this is an event which has been uh, self-organized and self-financed. So I'd like to thank all the volunteers that have helped us. Uh, I want to thank the sound engineers, the light engineers, those in charge of streaming. We did more than streaming. We had a live uh, streaming in the, in the TV channels, there were three TV channels that took parts of what was happening here tonight. Well, this is uh, very many people that have been following us in streaming in Europe, in the world, uh, thanks to the excellent job done by the in sound technicians. I would like to thank the interpreters that made it possible for us to understand each other. And so I thank them for the job that I'm um, quite aware of, which is a very difficult job. I'm getting to the end of my... I'd like to thank the Roman Aquarium and his uh, president, Alfonso Giannotti, who is in the room here. It's been a great honor for us uh, to be in this beautiful venue. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Well, the circular nature of this uh, space is, is extraordinary. Uh, with respect to the classical sort of uh, setting of a th theater is a typical of our policy uh, approach. I'd like to close with an extraordinary filmmaker and director, an Italian director, who has been in charge of this event and uh, the person that has uh, spent uh, uh, nights uh, without uh, sleeping at all uh, to sort of pushing me to achieve this uh, results. Uh, I'd like to thank Berardo Carboni. You want to say something? I think you have heard uh, many people saying very interesting things. So I'd like to give the floor to the orchestra. So the Underground Night Orchestra. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.